From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. Today, we wrap up our series on the Boston College gambling scheme. The story began in the late 70s when a group of mobsters saw a potential fortune in college basketball. In the scheme they cooked up, they'd gamble on basketball games at Boston College, and they'd recruit players to manipulate the outcome of games. The athletes wouldn't be throwing games, just have to win or lose by a certain number of points. But what the mob presented as easy money for student-athletes Jim Sweeney, Ernie Cobb, and Rick Kuhn would turn into a whirlwind of broken dreams and years in prison. The Boston College point-shaving scandal made national headlines and revealed just how much rides on a student-athlete's performance. One wrong move can ruin their chance at a professional career, and making ends meet can sometimes be a heavy burden no matter how well they play. Historically, student-athletes have been prohibited from receiving pay according to rules put forth by the National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA. That's left players unable to profit from their own work, while NCAA athletics departments have generated billions in revenue. Some athletes and institutions have chosen to take a risk and break the rules. But those rules are changing. That's partly due to pressure from state legislatures in California, Colorado, and Florida. Governors of these three states have signed bills that would make it possible for college athletes to profit from commercial use of their name, image, and likeness. Today, I'm speaking with Dan Murphy, a staff writer with ESPN's Investigative and Enterprise Unit. We'll talk about how the NCAA's new rules could play out and what it means for the future of college sports. American Scandal is sponsored by the new Audible original Bad Republican by Meghan McCain. In her debut audio memoir, Meghan McCain gives a first-hand look into the life of the conservative rebel and departing co-host of The View. You'll hear what it's like to grow up as the daughter of an American icon and to mourn his loss very publicly just one year into her tenure as co-host of America's most-watched daytime talk show. Her memoir also reveals how she handled attacks from the U.S. president and her thoughts on cancel culture, dating, and how our country treats new mothers. It's unsparingly honest, deeply relatable, and highly entertaining. Go beyond what you know about Meghan McCain from TV and your newsfeed. Visit audible.com slash bad Republican and listen now. We get support from the new podcast, Hemingway's Picasso. Stephen Coe lived many lives. He was an NFL journeyman, a male model, and one of the most well-connected smugglers in 1980s Miami. Coe collected many souvenirs from his adventures, but his most treasured bounty, a beautiful ceramic crafted by Pablo Picasso and gifted to Ernest Hemingway at the author's Cuban home. So the story goes. Lost during the Cuban Revolution, the artwork resurfaced when Coe took it as payment for a drug run financed by the notorious Pablo Escobar. Coe passed away in 2018, passing the piece down to his son, Stevie. Stevie feels he needs to complete his father's mission of selling this piece and telling Steve's cinematic life story. Is the Picasso authentic or a fraud? Was Steve Coe a big talker or a real deal smuggler? Listen to new episodes of Hemingway's Picasso every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. Dan Murphy, welcome to American Scandal. Lindsay, thanks for having me. Let's start this conversation with the idea of amateurism. The NCAA has been adamant about drawing a clear line between student and professional athletes, and not paying student athletes is a big part of that. But in 2018, NCAA sports generated over $10 billion in revenue, and the highest paid coach in college football that year made over $8 million. What's the rationale for not paying college athletes when there's clearly a lot of money to be made off the work these students put in? Right. A amateurism is an interesting loaded word. And honestly, in the past couple of years, the NCAA has actually started veering away from it and starting calling things the collegiate model a little bit because athletes are already making a little bit of money, stipends to meet the cost of attendance based on some court cases in the past decade. But the, the justification that the NCAA has used is that they want to maintain a difference between professional sports and college athletics. And legally, they want to do that because they say it's an, an important piece of their business that they'll lose the rabid fan base they have if they just become another minor league sports league. A more public facing reason for doing that is they want to maintain that their top priority remains providing an educational experience for athletes. And uh, I think there's a, a wide variety of students that all fall under the NCAA's control, right? There's 450,000 student athletes in any given year, and they range from anything to the guy who was pretty good on your high school team to the very next LeBron James and everywhere in between. So where some of those people, the, the idea that this is an educational and enriching experience, first and foremost, that, that does make sense. But for some of the guys at the top end of that talent spectrum, it's certainly viewed a lot differently uh, these days. These rules have always been a point of contention, and their flouting is as old as the rules themselves. Can you give us some examples of how the NCAA rules have been cheated in the past? Sure, yeah. There's no shortage of ways that the people have tried to put more money in the pockets of athletes over the past 50, 100 years. Throughout the history of the NCAA, that's been a consistent thing, I'm starting with players all the way back in the 1920s who would move from one school to the next, collecting a paycheck, and really one of the reasons why the NCAA has formed the way it has. And much more recently, I guess there's been a whole string. There was, in the 1980s, one of the most famous cases was SMU, when they were a top football program down in Texas, was paying players directly 
other boosters were putting money in players' pockets, and they eventually received a death penalty for that, which is an NCAA term for not allowing them to participate in the sport for several years and derailed what was then a, a top flight program in college sports. Uh, the University of Miami, more recently in the 2000s, got into a bunch of trouble for a booster named Nevin Shapiro, who was taking athletes out on his yacht and giving them money and, and giving them cash incentives for good performances on the field and was uh, somebody who was on the sidelines when they were winning national championship games and one of the most dominant programs in the country. And they eventually also got in trouble for that. There are a lot of other creative ways that are, are less pinned down and, and specific where plenty of schools have helped maybe the parents of athletes get a good job around that campus as a way of trying to entice them to come to that particular school. There are Reggie Bush, who won a Heisman out at USC, was his parents lived in a very nice house uh, during his time at USC, and that was arranged for them by the school as part of a recruiting inducement. Um, there's some allegations out there right now as part of an active court case, in fact, that Duke's Zion Williamson, maybe the most famous college basketball player in, in the past few years, uh, received similar kind of inducements from Duke, although that, none of that has actually been proven. And then most recently in the world of college basketball, the FBI corruption scandal was basically a way of looking into how big shoe companies like Adidas uh, and Nike have tried to filter money into grassroots basketball, AAU, where a lot of the top college stars come out of in order to nudge players towards schools that wear their particular shoe and their particular clothes. Um, and they, so they set up a pretty sophisticated operation through AAU coaches and assistant basketball coaches, setting up ways to make sure players could get money or their parents could get uh, some type of deal. And, and that ranged anywhere from you know a few thousand dollars of, of cash in a shoebox to some players who say they were given upper of $100,000 in order to attend a particular school. So there's clearly a lot of money and a lot of efforts to circumvent these rules. And recently, there's been a lot of pressure on the NCAA to change its stance on permitting student athletes to be paid. And in turn, the association announced it's formulating some new rules, which essentially would allow players to be paid by third parties for use of their name, image, and likeness, essentially sponsorships. The details aren't completely finalized, but um, can you give us a rundown of how they would work from what you know so far? Yeah. So, so far, what the NCAA has done is sort of broken into three different groups, what they see as potential opportunities for athletes. One's called work product, and that's the most likely to go through and be accepted. That relates to things like student athletes actually starting a camp or starting their own business or inventing some type of product that they might be able to use and market alongside of their ability as an athlete. And there's something called individual licensing that's more commercials and apparel deals and signing autographs and that type of thing. And then there's a, a category called group licensing, which is used in a lot of pro sports and it's how they negotiate the money that athletes get for jersey sales or video games or other items like that, that every athlete who's part of that group might get a cut of a bigger fee. And so far, the NCAA has proposed that they would allow athletes to make money from their work product endeavors and the individual licensing in the future. And they've decided they need to do this. This is something that they want to do. They have not worked out the details of how that would actually look. And they have not voted to officially accept that these things are going to happen. So the Board of Governors, which is the top government body of the NCAA, has said, we support this idea of change. Uh, but the the rest of the group will try to work out some more of those details in, in the coming months. And in January 2021, they're expected to vote on whether or not to change those rules. None of these three buckets include direct payments for playing. That's right. That's right. So this would continue to strictly prohibit schools from paying athletes directly or from schools being involved in setting up any kind of endorsement deals for athletes or athletes. A Duke basketball player, for example, or a Boston College basketball player would not be allowed to wear their school's logos or names in any of these advertisements based on the proposal that the NCAA has made so far. So these proposals are probably controversial. What's the debate on, on both sides? Yeah, so there's been probably for the past quarter century, a growing movement to say athletes deserve a bigger piece of the pie. And college athletics has changed dramatically since these amateurism rules were first put into place. And especially with the onset of, of television contracts, and you know, most of these major conferences have their own television networks at this point. As you mentioned, it's an industry that now generates billions of dollars on a regular basis. And the majority of their labor that's attracting a lot of that money gets a, a scholarship and a few thousand dollars in exchange where athletic directors and coaches are now making millions of dollars on a regular basis. And that money is being spread out and spent uh, among a lot of folks that aren't the ones actually putting in all the, the blood, sweat, and tears to earn it. On the other end, the NCAA is arguing that they're worried that paying athletes will take away from the fundamental principle of what they're trying to do, which is provide an educational experience for these athletes. And they're worried that by allowing them to make endorsement money, they'll sort of cross a tipping point that will change the nature of college athletics into another professional league. There are a lot of sort of nuanced legal arguments and, and labor laws involved that could potentially be impacted by some of these changes that are right now being discussed and debated. There was an argument made and lost decades ago in 1986 that moving away from amateurism in the Olympics would take away from the principle of the sport. What do you think the similarities and differences are of these two movements of reform in amateur sports? Yeah, a lot of the advocates for change do point to the Olympic movement and say, look, you can maintain the the mystique and the appeal of a movement like the Olympics, even though the athletes are allowed to advertise for Home Depot and McDonald's in the year that they're in the Olympics. The argument against it, or I guess the main difference, is that in the Olympics, your team is determined by your passport. Your team that you're going to compete for is already decided for you. The main fear among a lot of the stakeholders in college sports is that if athletes are allowed to make money through endorsement deals, that those will then become 
a part of competitive recruiting. So much of this is tied up in the recruiting world and wanting to be able to create a fair shot for all of the hundreds of schools that participate on the same level of college sports. Uh, there are plenty that would argue that that fair shot doesn't really exist now. There are other ways of creating recruiting advantages that clearly many schools have taken advantage of. The Alabamas and LSUs in the football world are competing for a different level of recruit than most of the rest of the country. But the principal argument made about the difference between the Olympics and college sports is that because athletes are recruited, there's a fear that these become a very thinly veiled way of just enticing recruits with what's essentially a, a payment to show up to a particular school. Now, it might be the case that uh, these aren't really the NCAA's rules to change. Some states are, are forging their own regulations. Give us an overview of what's happening across the country. Yeah, those state rules are actually the impetus for why the NCAA is changing. And public opinion has changed in the past decade on this. And we can see that because there are a lot of state legislatures that are starting to get involved in passing laws that would make it illegal for schools in their state to follow some of these NCAA rules about how athletes can make money. The first state to pass one of these laws was California back in September of 2019. And since then, both Colorado and more recently, Florida have followed suit and they've passed their own laws. Florida is will, will go into effect most quickly. That's next summer, 2021, that the state of Florida will have a law basically uh, making it illegal to follow the NCAA's current rules. The, the other states don't go into effect until 2023. But there are more than two dozen other states that have started working on similar legislation. And a couple of federal lawmakers on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., who are also interested in uh, creating a, a federal law that addresses these issues. Let's investigate the primary notion against paying student athletes. There is a, an argument, a good one, that college athletes are at college first and athletes second. They're there for an education, not a job in sports entertainment. So is it fair to say that lifting restrictions on whether athletes get paid will undermine that notion, regardless of how much money the NCAA makes off these players? Yeah, I'm not sure that that's the best, the strongest argument that these guys can make. I, you know, I think there are plenty of college students who are able to make money and still remain a part of an educational process who don't play sports, whether it's a student who might be involved in, in music or starting their own business or any other way of, of making money while they're in school. And no one seems to have a problem with that happening for students that aren't athletes. And one, one of the ar other counter arguments to that that we hear frequently is that if this is really about education first, then why are the coaches not capped in any way? If you're going to cap what the athletes are going to make, why do the coaches make 100 times more than the average professor on a college campus. Let's, uh, let's look at the history of these scandals. We just finished our series on the Boston College gambling scheme, which was not directly related to boosterism or paying athletes directly from the university, but it's one of many similar schemes and scandals in college sports. Looking at the long history of these scandals, do you think we keep seeing them because athletes aren't paid? I do think that at least plays a role in it. Uh, with the Boston College scandal specifically, that might be a little bit different just because of all the specific circumstances leading up to that one. But there certainly would be less temptation to be involved in any kind of illegal activity if you have other ways of making money above the board. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that the NCAA and frankly, public opinion has changed a little bit on this in the past 10 years or so. A, a lot of these athletes come from poor backgrounds and are trying to support families on some of the, the small stipends that they get at home. If, if they're presented with a way of making money, it's hard for an athlete to turn that down who's in a position where they, they need money. So being able to take that above board may eliminate some of the corruption and other problems that have occurred in some of these scandals that we see pop up pretty regularly in the world of college sports. In the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois, Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1st, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. These were secrets that once uncovered would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. The new true crime podcast, Shadow of Truth, explores a haunting murder that left investigators searching for a killer and on a mission for the truth. Police found Tyre Rada's dead body hidden behind a locked bathroom door. As the prosecution and police began to pull together evidence, one person of interest became their focus, Roman Zadarov. And within days, he confessed to Tyre's murder. Everyone considered the case closed, especially after Zadarov was locked up. However, recently revealed new evidence suggests there was a lot more to the story. With new DNA results and shocking witness testimony, Shadow of Truth unravels this mystery. To hear the whole story, listen to the podcast Shadow of Truth. Follow Shadow of Truth on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can binge all six episodes ad-free and early by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. As you mentioned, uh, student athletes from low income or marginalized communities often do have the most incentive to seek compensation, if only because they don't have the support structures and resources that other students might. In your reporting, have you seen these inequities being taken into account as the NCAA moves forward with its new rules? Yeah, absolutely. I think people realize 
why that's an issue. And, and honestly, it's kind of an interesting political issue because on the on the left or, or more liberal side, it, it's seen as a civil rights issue where you have the two sports that generate the most money, football and men's basketball, are a majority uh, African-American and, and minority athletes. And the coaches and the athletic directors who make money from those sports and, and have big salaries because of them are majority white. So it's seen as a civil rights issue on that front. And on the more conservative side, it's a totally different issue where it's seen as more of a, a free market. Government shouldn't be capping the, the salaries of anybody uh, type of an issue. Well, let's talk about an idea that's familiar into the sports world, but many people may not know about it. Player empowerment, certainly something that we're thinking more about right now. Could you tell us what this term means and how we're seeing it play out in sports like college football and basketball? Sure. I think traditionally in most sports, the idea is that one should sort of fall in line and follow the company line because it creates unity and that's good for a team and a strong team. That's changed a lot of people think it's been used to oppress athletes' voices and deter them from sharing their true feelings. I think especially now, uh, whether it's racial injustice or financial injustice or, or any other uh, major issue that we see in America, more and more athletes are speaking up. And I think there's a, a variety of reasons for that, but it certainly has grown as athletes have found more of a voice for themselves and have found that speaking up is, is met with a little bit more encouragement than maybe it was in the past. So it seems like there's more pressure on the NCAA now than ever before to let players be compensated somehow. Why do you think it's this particular moment that college athletes are getting more acknowledgement for their work? I do think this has been something that's built over time. You see some of these things erode in the NCAA rules over the past 10 years where they started allowing tacking more things on to the value of a scholarship and trying to slowly add more, but it has reached sort of a, a tipping point. I, I think that athlete empowerment has something to do with that. I think athletes having more of a chance to directly connect and, and share their voice on social media has certainly had an impact. And also the, the exponential growth of the amount of money in the system has really changed in the past 10 to 20 years. And I think people are just now kind of catching up to just how big this industry actually is at this point. We talked about legislation on the state level. What about federal? Yeah, so there's a lot of momentum right now for Congress to get involved in this decision at some point. In fact, the NCAA is eager for Congress to step in and help them. They're a little bit worried that if every state ends up coming up with a slightly different law, then players will end up choosing what school they go to based on which state has the most inviting rules for how they can make money, uh, because the rules are all a little bit different from state to state thus far. So the NCAA has asked Congress to step in and create one law that will apply to the entire country. And there are a couple different legislative proposals already on the table from Congress and, and a couple more that are likely to follow from other folks that uh, have been involved in college athletics. The most prominent one is probably a guy named Anthony Gonzalez, who was a, a wide receiver at Ohio State and then in the NFL. And he's now a congressman in Ohio. And he's sort of working along with folks in the NCAA to try to come up with a law that will greatly expand what athletes can make and open up opportunities for them while also trying to maintain this important distinction that the NCAA has tried to help hold on to between college and pro sports. And one of the reasons it's really important for the, in the eyes of the NCAA to hang on to that distinction is because for the past 10 years or so, the way that folks have tried to attack these amateurism rules and, and wear them away is through federal antitrust lawsuits. And those lawsuits have had some success where they've sued and said the NCAA is unfairly capping these college athletes' ability to make money, violating something called the Sherman Antitrust Act. And the NCAA wants to make sure that it's not opening itself up to even more potential to be sued for um, unfairly capping what their labor is able to make. So right now, scandals in college sports are often centered on the fact that the college athletes aren't paid at all because all payments are forbidden or illegal. But in the future, though, payments to college athletes of some sort could be allowed. That might only change the character of scandal in college sports, though. So in a world where college athletes are paid, what new scandals would you be worried about? That's a good question. I'm certainly there will always be some type of scandal. Right now, the big debate over what paying athletes or how athletes might make money in the future is going to look is how many restrictions are there going to be on this. I think it's clear that what's going to happen in the future is athletes will have more opportunities to make money. Right now, the NCAA wants to have a lot of control over all of the different ways that an athlete can make money. And how that all shakes out will probably determine about what those scandals might look like. Um, if the NCAA gets a lot of the restrictions that they're hoping, I think a scandal will start to look like an athlete finding ways around those restrictions and schools finding ways around those restrictions. One of the things the NCAA wants to avoid is, is a school setting up five or six endorsement deals for a, a high school senior who's a superstar quarterback or point guard and saying, if you come here, these five or six people have already agreed that they're going to sign you up for an advertising deal and you're going to be able to put $50,000 in your pocket in the first year. That under what the NCAA has proposed would still be illegal. And that's something that'll be very hard to police. That's one of the issues they haven't figured out yet is how they'll actually police and enforce some of this stuff. Um, so schools getting involved in trying to set up these deals, I think would probably be the first thing that might pop up in the future if this goes through. Dan Murphy, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. It was a pleasure. That was my conversation with Dan Murphy, staff writer for ESPN's Investigative and Enterprise Unit. Next on American Scandal. For decades, big tobacco made a fortune selling cigarettes to Americans of all ages. But the industry faced a day of reckoning in the 1990s. Whistleblowers came forward and exposed countless lies about cigarettes, addiction, and cancer. Those whistleblowers, along with lawyers and journalists, would soon face withering attacks from the tobacco industry. The legal battle that followed would culminate with a record-setting settlement. 
from Wondery. This is episode four of the Boston College Gambling Scheme for American Scandal. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review. Be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey, wondery.com slash survey, to tell us what topics we might cover next. You can also find us and me on Twitter. Search for the hashtag American Scandal or follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. And be sure to listen to my other podcasts too, American History Tellers and American Elections Wicked Game. If you'd like to learn more about the Boston College Gambling Scheme, we recommend Fix by David Porter and The Lufthansa Heist by Daniel Simone. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsay Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. This episode is produced by Audrey No and Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.